Welcome to Mercy Hill Church Online. My name is Anna, and I want to thank you so much for joining us through our online service. No matter how you've joined us today, I'm glad you're here. I want to encourage you to take a moment before we begin the service to share this video with someone else. Sharing only takes a few seconds, but the impact of sharing a gospel-centered service could change someone's life. If this is your first time ever tuning in to a Mercy Hill online service, or maybe you've been tuning in for several weeks, but you haven't yet connected with us, I want to thank you so much for investing a portion of your day to worship with us. Let me encourage you to take just a moment to fill out our online connect form. We'd love to know that you tuned in today, and we'd love to donate $5 to the charity of your choosing just for filling out the form. You can fill that out by texting MH Church to 41411, or you can simply visit our website. In that simple form, you'll be able to select which nonprofit you'd like us to donate to on your behalf. So if you're new to Mercy Hill, take the next step to partner with us to invest in one of these incredible organizations. Let's go to God and worship now through song. Welcome Mercy Hill Church. We are so excited to worship with you this weekend. But before we do, I'm gonna read Psalm 96 verses one through four. They read, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. As we sing together today, let's just remember that truth and give God the glory, the honor, and the praise that he deserves. i 
Mercy Hill, God has blessed us in incredible ways. He has raised up uh, a generation after generation, even in seven or eight years at Mercy Hill in terms of ministry of young, sharp leaders who are affecting gospel change uh, all over the country, in the nations, and yes, right here at Mercy Hill. Uh, one of the thrills of my heart in ministry is seeing young leaders raised up, and that's what we're having the opportunity to do today. Today's our first time ever we're doing a Young uh, Communicators Weekend. We have a list as long as your arm. We pick three uh, of our top young communicators these are guys that are going to go out plant churches, campus pastors, man, be pastors of other churches at some point uh, as they are raised up from within our ministry and they are sent out. Uh, if you're a part of Mercy Hill, if you give to Mercy Hill, man, there is just so much to rejoice in today as the Lord uses uh, these young guys um, to bring the word here this weekend. Man, I hope this is the most shared sermon that we have had all year, um, a showcase of what God is doing and I believe in these guys that much. Uh, so man, let's just enjoy this together. What's up, Mercy Hill Church? Uh, my name is Daniel Thompson, and I'm on our college team here. And man, I am super grateful and honored uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, first, man, I just want to say a thank you to Pastor Andrew. Um, that, man, he takes time to invest in us um, because, man, I know that he has a lot of other things on his plate, but it shows me and it shows us as a church, man, that he values sending and that we as a church value sending and the Great Commission. And I don't want to take that for granted. Um, because I know a lot of people and a lot of churches, man, we, we say, man, we believe in it, but we don't take the time to invest and equip the believers to actually fulfill it. Um, and then secondly, man, I want to thank you guys. Everybody I know that goes to Mercy Hill, all my community group members and everybody that goes to church with me, I know that you guys want to live a sent life and you value sending and you value making disciples and multiplying churches. And I never want to take that for granted. So, man, thank you, Mercy Hill, for everything that you've done for us, for me, um, man, and I hope and pray, um, man, that that will continue to happen. But, but let's get started. Here in America, I mean, I think you guys can agree with me, uh, man, that we kind of operate on a meritocracy, meaning, man, what you earn is directly tied to how hard you work and how well you work. Man, in America, we pride ourselves on it. We call it the American dream. And we say like, oh, man, there's the possibility that if you work hard enough, you can get everything you want. I mean, the possibility is out there, so go get it. I mean, we, we see it every day. Just this past, past week, man, my favorite quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, if you don't know who that is, he plays for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, two years ago, he won the MVP award, and last year he won the Super Bowl and the Super Bowl MVP. And he just got a 10-year contract worth almost $500 million. That's half a billion dollars. But nobody went to Twitter and Instagram saying like, oh, that's, that's too much or he doesn't deserve that. Everybody was like, well, yeah, I mean, he plays the game and he played it well and better than everybody else. So he deserves that. Man, and we know this. We know this how it works from a young age. Man, just a, just a couple of days ago, um, a lady in my community group came over to hang out with my wife because they haven't seen each other um, since the quarantine. But they came over and had coffee and caught up. And I got to hang out with her five-year-old son. And, and let me tell you, Trying to find something to do for fun with a five-year-old when you don't have kids is really, really hard. So I went and I scrounged up all the games that we had and me and him went through them and we landed on the game Sorry because he had never heard of it, never played it. It made me feel really, really old. But man, we, we go and I'm, I'm teaching him how to play as we continue on. You know, you draw a three, you move your piece three spaces forward. The goal is to get all your pieces all the way around um, to the safe place, to, to home. And well, then I drew a Sorry card. And if, and if you're unfamiliar with the game, Man, you have the option to do two things. One, you can take your piece and replace it with one of theirs and send them all the way back to start, or you can just move your piece four places forward and not mess with them. So I did the right thing and I sent that kid all the way back to start. You know, no mercy. Um, no, and, but he, then he said something that, that we all say and we've all heard. He said, that's not fair. That's not fair. Um, and what was he talking about? He was saying, man, I worked all the way around the board and then you didn't do anything and you got to take my spot. That's not fair. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. Man, that's how our world operates. Man, that's what we all think. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. Man, I'm not saying the world shouldn't operate that way. But the problem is the issue arises when we, when we see that and we apply that same ethic to God's kingdom. And Jesus says, man, that's not how it works. We say, God, I work a lot. I do a lot of good things for you. Therefore, I earn X, Y, and Z for you. I should be greater than this person who has done less. And Jesus says, that's not how this works. Man, we're going to see today in Matthew 20, we're going to look at the parable of the vineyard workers. And we're going to see that Jesus says, man, that's just not how my kingdom operates. And, and that's where I want to say our big idea for today. And that's this. Grace is a game changer. Grace is a game changer. It changes how we play the game. It changes the game. Before we read, let me give you a little bit of background on Matthew 20. 
Um, just before that, in Matthew 19, Jesus has talked to the rich young ruler. And he told the rich young ruler, man, to inherit eternal life, you got to sell everything you got. You got to sell it all and give it to the poor. And then follow me and you can have eternal life. And he couldn't do it. And it says in scripture that he walked away sorrowful. Well, then right after that, the disciples, Peter stands up and says, hey, Jesus, Jesus, we did that. We left our family. We left our friends. We left our jobs all for you. So what do we get? And three verses later, this is the parable that Jesus tells them. Um, Let's read it together. Matthew 20, starting in verse one. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius or one day's wage, he went with them, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give to you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house saying, these last only worked one hour and you have made them equal to us who borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Do you not agree? Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Man, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's for God's glory we pray. Amen. So the vineyard owner goes out multiple times throughout the day to get workers to come in and work in his vineyard. Man, some he gets in the morning and they work all day. Some work half a day. Some only work an hour. Then he pays them all the same. And the workers who worked all day are like, man, we ain't having that. No. Um, But the vineyard worker looked at them and says, can I not do with what is mine? I gave you what I said I was going to give you. Are you mad that I'm generous with the other workers? Man, the all-day workers have done, um, they've applied how the world works, and they've said this is how the kingdom should work. This is how it should work. But the vineyard doesn't operate that way. Because in the vineyard, in God's kingdom, and this is the first thing we see, grace changes the rules of the game. In God's kingdom, grace changes the rules of the game. Well, what were the rules? Man, in our world, your worth is directly tied to how much you work, how hard you work, and how well you work. Man, look back to the Patrick Mahomes contract. His success um, is in his work defined how much they said he was worth. And everybody was like, well, yes, man, he's the most worthy. He is the most worthy player right now. And that's the rules the all-day workers were playing by. We worked more, therefore we are worth more. But in God's kingdoms, the rules have changed. Your worth is no longer tied to your work. Your worthiness isn't tied to, man, are you on the top of the totem pole according to how much you've done for God? Well, man, if it's not tied to what I do, then what is it tied to? If our worth isn't rooted in our work, then, then what is it? Man, as a believer, your worth is found in Jesus' work. Man, we see it in verses 1, verse 3, and verse 5 and 6. Not a single one of the workers was brought into the vineyard because of the work they had done. They were brought in the vineyard because of the grace of the vineyard owner. And only that. Some of the workers worked all day. Some only worked one hour. But they received the same wage. It's because the the worth that the vineyard owner placed on them, the worth that God placed on us, is never based on what we did for him. But the fact that he brought us into his kingdom. Man, and, and our worth is not based on that. Man, their reaction was fair. And it was right. And it was just based on, on the way they were looking at it. Man, based on what the world says, that man, they worked more, therefore they deserve more. But God is saying, no, I've done it, so therefore you deserve the same. Man, immediately follow this parable, immediately following it. James and John, who were brothers and disciples, they get their mom and they go to Jesus and she asks him, she says, Jesus, can my son sit at your right and left hand? And what she's asking is, can my son, what do they have to do to be the greatest in your kingdom? And Jesus says, can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Meaning, can you die the death that I'm about to die. And they respond pridefully and say, yes, we can. Man, even after hearing this parable, they're still thinking, if I can work harder, if I can do the hardest things, then I can be the greatest in the kingdom. 
Jesus looks at them and says, no, 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 no. If you want to be great in my kingdom, you must be a servant. The best among you must be the servant. The best among you must be the slave or the bond servant. I mean, he said, look at me. I came to serve and not be served and to give my life as a ransom for many. I mean, what is Jesus trying to get them to understand? He's saying greatness in my kingdom isn't based on you coming out on top. It's based on the fact that I came out on top. And understanding that changes what you value. He's telling the disciples and he's telling us the kingdom of God operates on a whole new set of rules. It's not your work that makes you worthy, but mine. It's not your position in your world or your status among people, but my status and position in heaven. And if you're in my kingdom, you will no longer desire to put yourself above people, but you'll desire to serve. I mean, there's a, there's a stay-at-home mom, and she only gets one morning a week off. One morning to, to get a break from, from the work, and, and she has a routine that she does every Thursday morning. She goes to her favorite coffee shop that's right next to her favorite breakfast place, and she gets her little coffee dunker cookies, and she goes in the coffee shop, and she sits down, and she reads her favorite magazine, just like clockwork. Well, this one morning in particular, she goes into her favorite coffee shop and it's packed. There's nowhere to sit by herself. So she sits across from this older gentleman who's just reading his newspaper, minding his own business. And while, while she's sitting there enjoying her morning, he reaches into her bag of cookies on the table and grabs one and eats it. And she's confused and doesn't really know what's going on. Um, so she doesn't want to sound, seem rude and say something. So she does what I would probably do. And she reaches and grabs a cookie, staring him dead in the eyes. And she says, and just to tell him like, hey, this is my morning. Don't mess with my cookies in a nice way. And she eats it, staring him dead in the eyes. And he, he smiles politely. And then a few moments later, he reaches in and grabs another cookie. And, and he does it again and again and again till there's only one cookie left. And at this point, man, she has had it. She is about to go off the rails and she is so frustrated, but she can't get herself to say anything. Well, this guy, to her disbelief, reaches in and grabs the last cookie, breaks it in half and smiles and hands it to her. And man, she's had it. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. She stood up, she grabs her stuff. She's walking out of the coffee shop. She has had the worst morning ever. And right at that moment, she looks down and sees her bag of unopened cookies in her pocketbook. And all that anger and resentment that she felt towards the old man, one, probably turned to embarrassment, but also just to amazement over the, the patience and the grace this man showed her. And, and that's not the point. The point is this. Once we realize that the cookies we enjoy and we receive in life were bought by Jesus, man, it changes everything. It changes everything. And, that, and that's what, man, God is trying to show us that once you realize that his kingdom and your position in that kingdom was purchased by Jesus, you change. That is what happens. I mean, and here's our application that I want to walk through really quick. It's that grace changes you. That's the only option for grace in your life is that it changes you. I mean, as we close, I want to apply this to two groups of people. First, if you're a non-believer or a non-Christian, um, or you're a person who looks at their life and says, I'm a pretty good person. I work hard. I try to be as good as I can. I I'm give money to a homeless person. Sometimes I, I give to the church or to charity. And you think to yourself, I'm better than a lot of people. I'm not as bad as them. And you think this is what makes you good enough for God. Jesus telling you here, is telling you here, man, no, it's not. Perfection is what makes you good enough for God. And if you ain't perfect, you ain't good enough. But Jesus is. He lived the perfect life that you couldn't live and died the death that you deserve. And in his resurrection, he offers you the grace to come into his vineyard. He offers you the grace to come into his kingdom. And, and that's the question I have for you. Man, will you let grace change the game? Will you let grace change the rules of your life? Will you let grace change you? Man, and, and to the believer, and, and man, you understand that your work is found in Jesus' worth, that, you, that your worth is found in Jesus' work, and you understand that, that grace is a game changer, and you've accepted that the rules are changed. But here's my question for you. Has grace changed you, or are you still using the same strategy? What do I mean? Are you still trying to earn your status before God? You know that grace got you in, but your strategy for becoming great is working really hard. And you, you're going to go to church every week and go to community group as, as a means to say, God, I'm doing it. I'm doing what I can. I should be great. Man, some of us are still using the old strategy, man, even though we know that the rules have changed and the game has changed. It's all about winning and beating others. Man, here's a question I have to ask myself that to see, man, am, am I living a life that's been changed by grace? Or am I still trying to beat others and come out on top? And, and this is the question. Man, when I see another brother or sister stumble or fall in their walk with Christ, if I see somebody stumble into sin, is my initial thought, is my initial reaction, how could they do that? I would never do that. And they call themselves a Christian. 
serves them right? Or is it, man, if it wasn't for God's grace, that could be me. You look at them and say, man, this doesn't make you inadequate. It means you need to repent and fall down at the feet of Jesus and thank him that it was never based on your work to begin with. And you say, how can I help you? How can I serve you? Man, when you realize that grace is the kingdom ethic, it changes everything. Grace is a game changer, man. It, it changes the rules of the game. It changes us. Will you let God in his grace change you? Man, let's pray. Lord Jesus, and we thank you that it is not based on our work. God, we thank you that, man, you have brought us in on your grace. And it's not our work that makes us great, God, but that your grace changing us to serve others and to love one another. God, for those of us who think that, that our work can make us good enough for God, I pray that we would see that, man, we will always fall short. But you stand there and you say, if you look at Jesus on the cross and believe that he is your worth, that you will call us into your vineyard, into your kingdom. But God, for the believer, I pray that we would just continue to grow in grace and serve one another, to become the low, to take the lowest position. God, because you love us and it's all by your grace. It's in your, it's in your name we pray. Amen. What's going on, Mercy Hill Church? My name is Nico Williams. I'm a part of our college staff team here at Mercy Hill. But before we dive deep into this thing, I do want to take the time to say thank you to our church. I want to say thank you to our executive staff team for opportunities like this. But I also want to give a special shout out to Brian Miller, who is our missions director, who has put together what we call their sermon cohort, which just gives us an environment to become a better preacher, to become a better teacher, to become a better communicator. Man, it's things like this that really communicate to me and I believe the rest of our church that, man, we really are about making disciples and multiplying churches. And so, man, let's just go ahead and dive in. Y'all, when I was a kid, I grew up, we didn't have cable. And so we would watch things like Arthur, Read Between the Lions, Reading Rainbow. Anybody else live that PBS Kids Go lifestyle? Yeah, so at least one week out of every summer, my parents would ship us off to our grandparents' house, and they did have cable. And so you can imagine the, 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 the arguments that would come out of who was going to watch what and when. And so the way we would determine who got to watch what and when was who had the remote control. You all have probably been there before. Man, I would always tell my sister, don't ever let me see you drop the remote because I'm going to scoop it up. It's going to be mine. We're going to watch what I want to watch. Don't ever go off to the bathroom without the remote because, again, I'm going to take it and we're going to watch what I want to watch. And so we would do all we could to hold on to this remote for as long as we could. That is until it was time for us to leave to go somewhere like church or get something to eat. But no sooner than we got home, we would rush off to the, the front door to see if we could be the first one into the living room to grab the remote. That is until one day I got smart. One day we get home from wherever it was we were coming from, and my sisters, they rush off to the front door trying to get into the living room, but I'm walking just as cool as a cucumber could be. I'm walking, I get up to the door, and I see all of a sudden they've ripped up the living room looking for this remote, and I'm still walking casually. I walk past the living room into the bedroom where I have hid the remote. You know, we've all been there, y'all, because I think if, man, if you've got brothers and sisters or even little cousins, we all recognize, man, the remote control symbolizes who was in control. It symbolizes who had the authority. And y'all, Mercy Hill, that's what we're going to be talking today. We're talking about today, who is in control of your life. Today we'll be talking about how much more should we give over the authority to Jesus because he is God's son. Man, in fact, if I was to give you a frame or a main idea for today, it would be this. Jesus has authority because Jesus is the son. Y'all, I'm about to get into our text. We're going to be in Luke chapter 20, verse 9, starting at verse 9. But let me just give you a context of kind of where Jesus is in the narrative of his ministry. Y'all, he's just entered into Jerusalem in what is called the triumphant entry. He's kicked out some of the money changers of God's temple. They just disrespected God's temple. And now he's teaching in the temple, and some religious leaders come up to Jesus, and they say, hey, who gave you the authority to do the things that you're doing? So that's what we're going to pick up. Um, it's Jesus' parable that we're going to look at today. A parable is just a picture trying to explain something. This parable is Jesus' response to the religious leaders of Jesus' day. But, y'all, it also serves as a warning to us all in our day. Y'all, let's pick it up. Verse 9, it says this. And he began to tell the people this parable. 
A man planted a vineyard, and he let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed, and he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. Y'all go to God in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I need you to do now in me what I can't do on my own. Lord, I need you to open up ears so that people can hear your gospel. Lord, I need you to take the shades off of people's eyes so that they could see your gospel. God, I pray that you would just open up hearts so that they could feel and experience your gospel. Lord, there is nothing that I could say that could change anybody's heart. So God, I'm trusting and relying on you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all, remember the main idea for today is Jesus has authority because Jesus is the Son. So let's dig into this parable to see what we can't pull out, all right? Now, there's this man. He owns this vineyard. Um, That represents God, and he hires tenants. These are supposed to represent the religious leaders of Jesus' day. He hires these tenants to work this vineyard, and he goes off to this other country. Y'all, in essence... This man makes these tenants stewards, meaning that this owner, he still owns the vineyard. He's just given it to them to manage. And when the time comes for this man to reap the harvest, he sends servants. And these servants are supposed to represent the biblical heroes. And he sends servants to obtain his share of the harvest. And what happens? Y'all, these these tenants, they beat this servant. They beat them, and he he sends them away empty-handed. Y'all, I think something must have happened. Something must have shifted in their minds because these tenants, they must have woke up one day, got confused, and thought to themselves, this vineyard, oh, yeah, it actually belongs to me because we ain't seen the owner in who knows how long. Y'all, this is crazy because the owner of the vineyard has hired these tenants to work his land. He's even willing to take care of them for their labor, and these tenants have the audacity to decide that the original arrangement no longer works for them. Y'all, the scripture says that the owner sends three servants, and they all meet the same fate. Finally, the owner says to himself, you know what? I'll send my son. They have to respect my son. At first, the owner sends servants. He sends ambassadors. He sends messengers to represent him to the tenants. He, he says to himself, since I'm not there, I'm going to send someone to carry out my message. But y'all, as we see in the parable, that doesn't work. Finally, the owner says, you know what? I'm going to send my son. And, and, and there's this big difference between the ambassadors and the son. See, the ambassadors could only carry out the message, but not only can the son carry out the message, but he's also an inheritor of the vineyard. In other words, in this story, the son is as good as the owner. And what do they do? They said in their hearts, y'all, if this is the heir, if we kill him, we will own the vineyard. So they killed the son. But y'all, here's two big problems with their line of thinking. Number one, even though they killed the son, they still don't own the vineyard. And then number two, the owner is still alive. Y'all, this story is aimed at the chief priests and the religious elites of this day because they were given a responsibility to manage the vineyard. They were given a responsibility to help maintain a right relationship with God for the people of Israel. But instead, they decided that they owned the vineyard themselves. Y'all, you know, they created rules and laws and guidelines, and they tried to determine who was clean and who was unclean. And y'all, you know, this was just not of God. They looked at the vineyard that God gave them to manage, and they said, no, 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 this, this is mine. Y'all, this story is aimed at the chief priests and the scribes, but it could just as easily be aimed at our own hearts. We look at the things that God gives us to manage, and we say, no, 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 God, this is mine. 
I'll do what I want with the money that I've earned. I'll do whatever I want with the body I have. I won't unleash my kids fully for the sake of God's mission because they're mine. It's my mouth, so I'll say what I want, however I want. I'll decide what truth is to fit the desires of my own heart. And in other words, we say, Lord, this vineyard that you gave to me to manage, I'm claiming it as mine. But I need y'all to understand, it don't belong to you. None of it ever belonged to you. Man, the one who owns it all is Jesus because he is the son and Jesus has the authority. Y'all remember the remote control games that I played as a child? Y'all, essentially, we're all playing this same game. We're all struggling to give over the remote of our lives to Jesus and his authority. And the question is, why? Y'all, there are some of us tuned in right now, who, who you know you haven't submitted and surrendered to Jesus' authority because you can't imagine giving up the remote control of your life. You might be thinking to yourself, well, who can run my life better than me? I'm going to tell you the Sunday school answer, and that answer is Jesus. But y'all, I'm willing to bet that if you, you, for, you might acknowledge this yourself if you just gave it a, a little bit more thought. Y'all, we would all agree that none of us are perfect, in fact, we often use this same logic, to this same reason to excuse us from any wrongdoing. But y'all, how can we say on one hand, we're not perfect, but then on the other hand, we trust the imperfections of our own self to run and rule our lives. We say, we're not perfect, but we're going to trust our imperfect logic. We're not perfect, but yet we trust the desires of our own heart that often lead us into sticky situations that we would have preferred not entering into into the first place. But hey, you're smart. You you probably recognize this. So you would say, okay, I know I'm not perfect, and you say Jesus is, but why should I trust him? Now, the answer is we can trust Jesus' authority because he wasn't willing to abuse his authority. Y'all, this is the main reason we don't like to submit to anyone else's authority, because you don't want to be burned. You know, if you lead your own self down the wrong path, you just justify it by saying, well, hey, at least I chose it. But, man, if you give over the authority of your life to someone else, the fear is that that person won't lead you rightly. (laughs) Y'all, one way I've come to terms with this in my own life is trusting Jesus for my future. Y'all, I went to school. I went to the best school in all of triad, North Carolina A&T. Can I get an Aggie pride? I went to school to become an actor. Y'all, I love performing and telling stories, but, but there came a point in my life where I felt like God was leading me away from theater, and he was leading me towards pursuing the college residency program here at Mercy Hill Church. And man, when you're standing in between two difficult decisions, you want to know that you won't get burned. Yeah, I could have stuck with what I knew. You know, I know how to learn my lines, hit my mark, do the work of building a character, or I could jump into the unknown of ministry because God was leading me. But here's God's promise when you trust him. He says that those who are called according to his purpose, that love him, all things work together for their good. And y'all, this doesn't mean that all things, that that everything is going to be peachy keen and that you'll always be comfortable, but it will always work out for your benefit. Y'all, the point is this. If you trust in God's authority, God says, hey, I'm going to take care of you. Now, y'all remember that phrase that we were just talking about, I'm not perfect? Well, Jesus was perfect, and he died in spite of those same imperfections. Y'all, the Bible tells us that Jesus literally became a curse so that you might become blessed. Jesus became sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. But, y'all, here's the whole reason why I bring it up. Jesus had the authority to come off the cross, but he didn't. Jesus had the authority to call down angels to defend against his death, but he didn't. He took on death for you. Y'all. This isn't Jesus not only abusing his authority, it's also Jesus not using his authority when he should have. Y'all, I plead with you, give over the authority of your life to Jesus. Man, if you're listening to this message and you think to yourself, you know, I've been saved for I don't know how many years. I've given over authority of my life. Man, I just want to see if I can press in to just challenge you to wrestle with this idea of Jesus ruling every aspect of your life. Man, can you say that your life is characterized by a hands down, Jesus said it, I'll believe it, I'll do it kind of mentality? Or do we just give Jesus control of the big areas of your life? Man, how about, what, do you give God control over what you will and won't say over social media? You know, the things that you like, the things that you repost and retweet, they all say something about the way that you follow God. Now, I'm not suggesting that everything you post on social media has to be about God, but what I am saying is that none of it should go against him, his people, or his glory. Y'all, 
I just got one more thing to say, and then I'm going to just take my seat. At the end of this parable, the Bible says that Jesus looks directly at the chief priests, and he quotes Psalm 118, and he says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Y'all, Jesus quotes the Psalms because he's speaking their language to say, hey, 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 y'all, the scriptures say that the very one that you're rejecting has become the cornerstone. I am the very one this whole thing has been built around. I own the vineyard. Y'all, we know how the religious leaders responded. Just as Jesus foretells in the parable, they killed Jesus. But that was according to the will and the plan of God. Thankfully, he didn't stay dead. Question is, how will you respond? You know, as a kid, I wouldn't give up the remote control for anything. But Jesus gave up the remote control of his own life to show you where true life is found. Will you just give over the authority to Jesus? Y'all, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you that even in our imperfections, your perfect, your perfect way and your perfect will leads us rightly. God, I pray that this word would take root in the heart of the people listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What's going on, Mercy Hill? My name is Tanner Hogue, and in addition to being the oldest member of the Young Communicators, I'm the director of middle school ministry here at Mercy Hill Church, and I just want to give a special shout out to the students out there. What a weird time to be a student. We are proud of how you guys are handling it, and we want to bless you guys. We're going to have a summer encounter experience on August 5th through 7th. We can't wait to see you there. Registration opens on July 22nd. You're not going to want to miss it. Also, before I dive in, I just want to say I love this church. I love my pastor. I'm so thankful for this opportunity, and I'm ready to rock and roll. And They, less, they messed up. Let me go last. Y'all ready? Let's do it. If you have a copy of Scripture, you can go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 11. We're going to be starting in verse 5 with the parable of the persistent friend. And while you're turning there, I want to talk about a classic movie called The Sandlot. If you haven't seen it, it's about a, a young group of boys who love the game of baseball. And every day they play in a park that they call The Sandlot. Right behind The Sandlot is the house of an old scary man with a scary dog who's done some scary stuff. And they heard these rumors. And basically one day... They hit their last baseball over that fence, and that baseball happened to be signed by one of the most famous people of all time, Babe Ruth, okay? And the rest of the film, they're trying to get the ball back, okay? They destroy property. It takes many days. It's very, like, fun stuff. And at the end of the movie, they're standing in the old man's house with the dog, like, right there with them. He's not as scared as he thought he was. And the old man asks this question. He says, why didn't y'all just come on over and ask me? I would have gotten the ball for you. And the kids kind of go crazy. It's a rhetorical question, but he knows the answer. You didn't ask me because you didn't think I was good. You didn't ask me because you didn't trust me. If I'm being really real, you didn't ask me because you didn't know me. Y'all, don't we long so badly to know someone who can be relied on in every situation where we don't have to question their character? Y'all, today we're talking about prayer, and our prayer, both in frequency and fervency, is directly tied to our understanding of and our trust in the God to whom we pray. Today's big idea, if you're taking notes, is this. Persistent prayer displays our neediness and God's goodness. So let's dive into the passage, point some things out, and then we'll get into that. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him, and he will answer from within. Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. Sheesh, I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks find. It's the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Different cultural times, there is one house, one room, it's small, and this scene is kind of crazy. Like everyone listening at the time would have known what's going on. Why are we talking about prayer? Because back in verse 1, Jesus is asked by his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. When you tell somebody, teach me to do something, you're basically saying, tell me how to do it. You're not asking for a history lesson or the, the background on that thing. If I say to you, teach me to play basketball, I want you to teach me how to shoot. So what the disciples are basically revealing is they think they know what prayer is. They just want their teacher to teach them how to do it. And many of us are right there if we're honest. We think we know what prayer is. We just need some help with the practical. 
from the second I brought up that topic, many of you already told yourself what you'll need to change. You want to hear how to tweak things, freshen it up a bit. But y'all, what if we need to unlearn what we think we know about prayer before we can really begin to pray? Jesus is trying to challenge what we think we know. You see, our prayer lives don't just need reformation. They need transformation. After Jesus tells the parable of the friend, he continues with this illustration of, a, of how earthly dads know how to give good gifts and comparing it to God the Father. See, there's a problem with this for those of us that are super practical, right? Because there doesn't seem to be anything to do with that. It's not about something to do. It's about how to view someone. So in total, in verses 1 through 13, Jesus gives us a teaching, a parable, and then an illustration on prayer. What does Jesus want us to take away? Y'all, he knows we're just like the disciples Prayer isn't just about how, it's about who. Who is praying and who is being prayed to. So let's look at both of those. First, who is praying? The constant asker. Jesus is stressing that prayer involves asking, seeking, and knocking. Verses 9 through 10 describe this process of praying with an earnestness on the part of the asker, a continuous seeking, a constant knocking. I personally come to the conclusion Jesus is kind of saying you got to pray until you're actually praying. You see, the friend at midnight has a problem he can't meet on his own, so he goes to get help. The text says his friend wouldn't get up because, you know, being bedtime, like it's not worth waking everybody up. But because of his, somebody say impudence, that's right, impudence, it means shameless boldness, he got up and did whatever he wanted. You see, when you have a need you know you can't meet, you will go to great lengths to get it met. Prayer is how we express our desperation without God. So why would Jesus tell his disciples this story? Because Jesus is answering the question, not just how do we pray, but who prays? In short, Needy people pray. Right now, the, the Broadway performance term movie Hamilton is kind of taking our country by storm. Whether you have seen it and like it or don't like it or just heard about it, whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's very unique, unique take, unique songs. It's very entertaining. One thing you'll notice as you're watching it is that Hamilton was always a gifted guy in this film. Always had the charisma, always brought value to whatever he did, and was the same when he was George Washington's assistant. But it wasn't until the war got out of control and too much to handle that Washington really unleashed him, that Hamilton went from useful to indispensable. And prayer is much the same way. It's a cool thing on its own, but once you're in over your head, you got to have it. It's indispensable. In general, when life goes over your head and you're, you're sinking, you'll go to your knees in prayer. The man in this story was desperate. Prayer is a natural response in times of desperation. My fear is that many of us seek prayer as an isolated skill. We bring a New Year's resolution mentality to prayer, just something to get better at. Y'all, Jesus isn't interested in teaching his disciples a skill in isolation. You see, he, he assumes that these disciples are becoming the type of people who will be on the move on mission for him all over the world. And as such, they'll need prayer. They'll cling to prayer constantly and will get shamelessly bold with it. They're out sharing the message of the kingdom and trying to drive out demons. The struggle's going to get real in a hurry. And I'll be honest with you, just as a a pastor and a, a leader in the church, I get asked to help people with things like getting better at prayer. And I almost want to respond, well, why don't you try to love someone who hates you? Why don't you try to not gossip in a workplace environment filled with gossip? Why don't you try to share the gospel with somebody you think is indifferent to it? These situations will put you in over your head really quickly. They're hard, and you're going to pray like crazy. It would almost be a disservice to go straight into the mechanics of prayer without giving the context in which it should be brought about. Persistent prayer is the right response to being constantly needy. The needy person prays, and who do they pray to? They pray to the good Father. Jesus' final illustration teaches us that prayer carries with it a relationship between two parties. In Christianity, Christians relate to God as their father. You see, Jesus didn't only teach that God was his father or that he was one with God, but that Christians who place their faith in him now have the same fatherly access to God. You could say it like this, the access Jesus has to God, the believer now shares. So prayer is a relationship between a father and a child. The child brings the need and the father hears it and responds accordingly. We pray because our heavenly father is good and we trust him. Prayer is how we express our trust in God. The way Jesus brings this up is by comparing an earthly father to God the father. And I know for some of us, uh, just even bringing this topic up, We only know this in theory because we didn't have the best earthly example. For others of us, we did have a great uh, earthly father, and that's such a good gift. But in either case, the logic holds true. If even evil fathers, earthly fathers, know how to give good gifts, how much more 
God the Father. I don't know if you caught this, but the text says that evil earthly fathers give good gifts, but God the Father gives the Holy Spirit. It's like he's saying, y'all give gifts, God gives the gift, and the Holy Spirit is the good gift. The best gift God can give you is always more of himself, more clarity of who Jesus is, more insight into the things of God, who he is, what he has for your life, more hatred of sin. The Spirit does this in the life of the believer. God being willing and able to give us himself is his best gift. Think about it from God's perspective really quick. He creates humanity in his own image to be in relationship with him, but humanity turns their back on him. We've all done that in our sin. Sin separates us from God. Want to know how I know God is a good father? Because he didn't leave us in our sin. He didn't just have the desire to save us, but he put his son on the line to give us the opportunity to, to become sons and daughters. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will we not also with him graciously give us all things? God didn't just say he loved us. He dealt with the barrier between us and him by sending his son to, to live a perfect life and then die a criminal's death. And in his resurrection, anyone who puts their trust in him gets access to God as their father. We pray because this father is good. And before I move on, it seems like we have the liberty to say that in the same way that even evil earthly fathers know how to give good gifts, even an evil earthly father knows how to not give a gift that won't be good for their son, right? So the perfect example is if your four-year-old demands that all day, every day, they get McDonald's, every single meal, every snack, every drink, whatever they want, you're going to be like, oh, what'd you say, squirt? You want McDonald's? No. Like, I don't care how many times you ask because I've seen supersize me, okay? And I'm not going down that path with you. I love you too much. So we know Jesus isn't telling us prayer is a magic formula to get you whatever you want. He's not telling us how to wear God down by asking him until he gives in. Y'all, God is so good. Even when his answer is no, we don't question his goodness. We pray because we're needy and we pray because he's good. So this is what I want us to take away this week constantly bring your big needs to our good God. To my unbelieving friends, have you ever noticed how much more open you are to spiritual matters when you're on your last leg, when you're at the bottom? Y'all, this kind of points out a small example of a a simple truth. We weren't made to be self-sufficient. We weren't made to carry life on our own. We were made to be in relationship with God. We weren't made to watch our own back, but to trust God with it. We were made to know we could trust our Heavenly Father. Some of you have been coming around for a while now, maybe just during quarantine, and you would say, I I do believe God is good, and I know that. I see the cross. I see what he's done, and it's just time for you to put your trust in him and, and for him to become your father, you to walk in that. For others of you, maybe this is your first time hearing, you know, these three quick parables, and, and you're like, this is cool, but I, I ain't there. That's totally fine. Do what the pastor is just talking about. Keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking, keep investigating, asking uh, maybe a Christian friend who brought you. My encouragement to you would be, if this God is as good as advertised, you wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to investigate that for yourself because this Father wants to be found. To my believing family, can I be real for a second? Y'all, this passage teaches that when it comes to prayer, we don't annoy God with our persistence, but we can offend Him with our lack of confidence in His goodness. What if I told you the first step to getting the kind of prayer life God envisions for your life is to ask the question, Why don't I pray like this? And just sit in that question and ask the Lord. Meditate. Grab you a jug of water. Maybe you've got to wrestle all night with the Lord like Jacob did. I don't know. You might need to. I did that. You know what I came up with for me? Why I don't pray boldly and persistently? It's because I'm afraid. What, What am I afraid of, you ask? I'll tell you. Thank you for asking. I am afraid that if I pray the way the man in this story does, shamelessly, boldly, I'm being put in a position where if the Lord does not show up, I look like a fool. Where if he does not come into my life and it's really real and tangible and we're walking together and I'm having to trust him, I might look like a fool. So you know what I do? I back my prayers up a notch and they're just safe, cool, comfortable, and I never really give him an opportunity to show up. Y'all see how that works. And what I think the passage is trying to get at is, y'all, this is what... God wants with us. He wants this kind of intimacy. And yeah, it's going to be frustrating at times, but it's the real you and it's the real God. Are you like me, y'all? Are we hiding behind what we know? Are we hiding behind knowing to say God is good? Or do our prayers reflect we are grabbing hold of this good God? Prayer is how we grab God, y'all. It's how we know him. It's how we exercise our trust in him. 
I want to close on this story that uh, was brought to my mind as I was preparing this message. When I was in kindergarten, only time I ever did this, but I went to a skate party and I didn't skate. Went over to the arcade with my boy Ryan. Okay, normally I don't do that. I just go skate. But on this particular day, me and Ryan were hanging out. And what happened was we were just playing games and it was all his money. And eventually he ran out of it. But his dad was there. And I was like, I'm having fun. So I just went to his dad and asked him for some more quarters to play the games. So we kept playing. I kept asking. His dad kept funding it. I was like, Ryan, go get something from your dad. We just kept it going and going and going. And one of my friends who was skating came over and asked us what we were doing. I was like, we're playing games. He was like, oh, did your parents give you money? I was like, no. I've just been asking Ryan's dad. He was like, oh, you're crazy, man. That's so bold. And I was like, I didn't think nothing of it. I go home. You know, everything ends. We run out of money. It's all good. We go home. Later that night, I'm sitting in bed, and I'm just thinking to myself, you know what? Ryan's a lucky guy. If his dad was that good to me, and he had gave me that much of his resources, and I'm just a friend of his son, imagine what it'll do for Ryan. Imagine how deep his pockets are for his own son. Believer, listen to me. You are Ryan. You're all the way in. God has more to give than you could ever ask of. He has infinite resources, infinite goodness. He is for you. The question is, will we access the privilege that we have with God in prayer? Do you realize how in over your head you are in day-to-day life? Do you realize how good God is? Let's go to him with our requests boldly and all the time. Will you pray with me? Father, um, I just pray, just, just by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I, I beg you that we would see the reality that we are in over our heads, and we need you, Lord. And we would see how good you are in our prayers would reflect that. I pray that this church would be a praying church and and our knees would be worn out from just being in our prayer closets with you, Lord, because you're so good. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for what we have just heard from these young leaders in our church. At this time, we're going to continue worshiping through our giving. At Mercy Hill, we believe wholeheartedly that generosity fuels the mission. One of the ways that generosity fuels the mission here at Mercy Hill is through our college ministry, and our service today really demonstrates that. Every one of those guys we just heard from was shaped through college ministry. In fact, Nico and Daniel have been involved in our college residency program that develops young leaders right after they graduate college. And now they are key leaders in our college ministry, raising up the next generation of leaders. Church, that is an incredible thing. Our mission at Mercy Hill is to make disciples and multiply churches. And our college ministry is integral in seeing that mission accomplished. Right now, we have three college residencies making disciples on three campuses in the triad, but we want to see residents at all seven major college campuses in the triad. We know that there are more leaders out there on those campuses of 90,000 students. Some of them don't even know Jesus yet. Our vision is to see those college students impacted by the gospel and become the next wave of church planters and leaders. Church, we have the vision, but that vision only moves as quickly as your generosity. Let's partner together to give sacrifices sacrificially and see many more like Nico, Tanner, and Daniel raised up to make disciples and multiply churches. It is now easier than ever to give and fuel the mission at Mercy Hill through our online platform. Just text MHGIVE to 41411 or visit our give page on our website. Through our giving platform, you can set up a one-time or recurring gift in a matter of seconds. And you can know that the money you give to Mercy Hill is going directly towards the mission of making disciples and multiplying churches. So be sure to check that out today. Let's continue worshiping now through song. You are You give love 
Let's sing it again. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our breath. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our breath still only. Amen. As we close out our service today, I want to make you aware of two really big things happening here at Mercy Hill. The first is our outside service. Last week, we held our first outside service, and it was a powerful time of gathering together in worship. If you missed this last week, please know that we will continue to hold outside services in the coming weeks, and you can register for that today by visiting our website. Please note, space is limited, so be sure to register and reserve your spot for next week's service. Also, if you are not yet comfortable returning to in-person services, that is totally fine. We will continue to provide online services each weekend. Secondly, Kids Week is one of the most exciting weeks of a kid's summer here at Mercy Hill, so we couldn't let your kids miss out on it. This year, instead of you coming to Kids Week, Kids Week is coming to you. And with Kids Week being online, it's a great opportunity to invite your extended family, friends, and neighbors to have fun in a safe way. This year, we could see hundreds of kids who may not have been able to participate in Kids Week in the past. Now jump in and be part of the fun. It's happening August 10th through the 13th, and all you have to do is sign up. We will set you up with your very own Kids Week supply kit for every kid you register to attend at your home. To find out more details and to register, visit mercyhillchurch.com slash kidsweek. As we close out our service today, I want to point you to our website. Our site is loaded with resources for our families, and you can also find opportunities to serve. In addition, our site is also the best place to find the most up-to-date info about our plan for reopening our facilities, including details about the outside service we are offering on Sundays. Mercy Hill, God has equipped and called every believer to be on mission for such a time as this. Mercy Hill Church, you are sent out.